This episode of Basics with Babish is sponsored by Good & Gather, new products only at Target. Good & Gather is Target's flagship grocery brand, bringing shoppers high quality ingredients to create better tasting food for you and your family. Shop Good & Gather at your local Target store or online here. Once you have gathered all of your good, it's time to start making pie. And the first thing we gotta make when we make pie is a pie crust. And I'm going to take a page out of Rough Puff Pastries book and make it using a food processor. First thing we're doing is combining 10 ounces of all purpose flour with one teaspoon of kosher salt. Then we're gonna dump that into our food processor with the blade attachment attached, and just pulse a few times to make sure that everybody is good and combined. Then it's time to negotiate the butter, for which I'm going to use the grating attachment. Once that's spinning, I'm just going to press two sticks of thoroughly frozen, unsalted butter through the feed tube and into our flour mixture, which I'm then going to turn out into a bowl for easier combination. Give that a little toss to make sure that all the butter is coated in flour, and then we're going to start adding our ice water. And this is where you kind of have to feel out the recipe. I personally added 16 tablespoons of ice water, but that amount is going to depend on a thousand different factors. Pie is famously finicky when it comes to moisture. Basically, you just want to keep adding the water slowly and mixing the dough together until it just starts to hold its shape. Turn it out onto a work surface and gently knead it into one cohesive mass. Don't worry if it looks a little dry and crumbly because the flour will continue to hydrate in the fridge, which is exactly where this thing is headed for at least 30 minutes. We want every aspect of the pie crust to stay as cold as possible for as long as possible up until baking. Baking. Then once it's wrapped up in plastic, we're going to pat it out into a thick round disc that's going to make rolling out easier down the line. Keeping the butter cold is what's going to give us those pastry-like layers later on, so do not skip these steps. 30 minutes later, our pie dough is nice and firm, and not only will you notice that it has hydrated nicely, but you'll see that it's dappled with little bits of butter. That is exactly what we want, so now it's time to roll this guy out. I'm going to divide this in half for two reasons. First, so we can take a look at those layers of butter, and second, because I am making a double pie crust. So I'm taking half of this dough and putting it back in the fridge as we negotiate the bottom or shell of our pie. First, on a well-floured work surface that I'm going to reflour as necessary, I'm going to roll this guy out to a diameter one to two inches wider than my pie plate. You can see that because I divided my dough in half after the fact, this guy's coming out a little oblong, a little amoeba-like. I'm just going to patch my weirdness, but you can prevent this by dividing the dough in half before refrigerating. As always, I'm very happy when you can learn from my mistakes. So once we've got this guy rolled out to our desired specimen, Specifications. We're going to use the rolling pin to lift it up off the countertop, like so, and transfer it over to our awaiting pie plates. Yet another grandma trick brought to you by Grandma Babish. Then instead of pressing the pie dough into the corners, we want to lift and drop it into the corners. We don't want to stretch the pie dough. We also want to make sure that the dough is generously hanging over the sides of the plate. This will become important later on after this guy takes another 30 minute rest in the fridge. Now one of the problems with double crusted pies is people generally think you can't blind bake them. An essential step for preventing soggy bottom syndrome. But as you can see, we're doing just that. We're lining the pie dough with aluminum foil and filling with the pie weights of our choice. I'm using brown rice, baking in a 400 degree Fahrenheit oven for 12 to 15 minutes until just turning lightly brown. After which we're gonna take it out of the oven, remove the foil and dock it, which just means poking lots and lots and lots and lots and lots of little holes in the bottom using a fork. Then this guy's going back in the oven for another seven to nine minutes until a little more golden brown, during which time we're going to figure out our filling. Double crusted pie to me just screams apple. So we got three pounds of Honeycrisp apples here. You could also use Granny Smith, which we are going to painstakingly peel. I'm going to do the peel it all in one ribbon to prove that I'm a real man way. And then I'm going to cut the apple flesh off the core and slice into half inch pieces. Once that's all done, we're placing them into a very large bowl for tossing purposes. If your apples are going to sit out for a minute, make sure you toss them with a little squeeze of lemon juice. This is going to prevent them from turning brown. Not that that matters if they're ending up in a pie, but it's still a neat trick. Plus a little lemon juice tastes good in the pie along with the following. Three quarters of one cup of sugar, two to three tablespoons of all-purpose flour, depending on how gooey you like your pie, the zest of one of our previously squeezed lemons, a good pinch of kosher salt, a half teaspoon of freshly grated nutmeg, a half teaspoon of ground ginger, a full teaspoon of cinnamon, and the tiniest little sprinklings of allspice and ground cloves, all of which we are going to tiny whisk together separately from the apples before pouring over top and tossing. Make sure the apples are all evenly coated in the mixture, and that's it. That's apple pie filling. Pretty easy, right? Now we gotta finish prepping our pie crust so set these aside and wash your hands. Our bottom half of the pie crust is out the oven, so we're gonna let it cool just a little bit, prick it a few times with a fork to deflate any puff ups, and then we're gonna start trimming off the excess pie dough around the circumference. You will see why in a moment, but let's take an early look at what's happening to our pie dough. Look at those layers, look at that flake, look at those bubbles, boy I love to bake. And now the moment we've all been waiting for, or at least I have, filling the pie shell and preparing for it to reach its final form. We've rolled out the other half of our pie dough to the same thinness and width, unfurling 
pulling it over the apples, making sure that it's evenly distributed, trimming off any excess, and starting to tuck it in gently underneath the par-baked crust. Once that's done, all there is left to do is cut a couple vents in the top. You can do this however you like, but you do want the apples to be able to breathe, and then we're brushing the whole thing down with a beaten egg white and sprinkling the whole thing down with a few generous pinches of granulated sugar. This is gonna give the top half of our pie that crunchy, shiny shell we're looking for. Then it's going into our 425 degree Fahrenheit oven for anywhere from 35 to 50 minutes until our pie looks just like a pie. But don't you dare dig into this. This needs to cool for at least four hours. Just enough time to make some other pies. How about we make some pumpkin? For this one, I'm going bottom crust only, which means we need to be a little bit more decorative with our pie crust. So after lifting and dropping the dough into the corners of the pie plate, we're going to trim off any excess right to the edge of the pie plate. Hang on to that. It's perfectly good for decoration that I'm probably not going to do. And then we are fluting the edge of the pie crust, which basically just means placing your finger and thumb on the crust and pressing the dough up between them, repeating around the circumference of the crust until you have achieved a decorative pattern. And just like all our other pie crusts, this guy needs to rest in the fridge for at least 30 minutes, after which we can blind bake it as before. We're going to line it with aluminum foil, fill it with our pie weights, pop it in a 400 degree Fahrenheit oven for 12 to 15 minutes until lightly browned, removing the pie weights, docking like crazy, and then baking for another 7 to 9 minutes until lightly browned. Now let's talk pumpkin filling. Into a large bowl goes half a cup each granulated sugar and light brown sugar, a tablespoon of flour, a pinch of kosher salt, a half a teaspoon each of ground ginger, ground allspice, and freshly grated nutmeg, a little sprinkling of cloves, a teaspoon of cinnamon, and a few twists of freshly ground pepper. And that's it. Mix up until homogenous, and you've got yourself an easy, delicious pumpkin pie fill. I feel like I'm forgetting something. Oh, uh, pumpkin. I've got one can of pumpkin puree here, to which I'm going to add three eggs, one cup of heavy whipping cream. You can give that a little cursory mix if you like. Maybe use a bigger bowl. I don't know. This is my way of living dangerously, I guess. And then embrace your basic side because we're adding our homemade pumpkin pie spice. Mix until completely homogenous, taste for tastiness. I'm gonna add a little glug of maple syrup. I think that's gonna work nicely. And then pour the mixture into our blind baked crust. Then this guy's headed into a 400 degree Fahrenheit oven for 45 to 55 minutes. Now, sometimes your crust can brown too fast. I'm taking this out right now at about 25 minutes. And to prevent it from burning, I'm going to wrap the edges in a thin strip of aluminum foil, making sure not to cover the pie filling, but making sure that the edges of the crust are protected. Another 20 minutes later, the pie emerges from the oven perfectly browned, and to prevent the pie from cracking, you want to take it out of the oven when the filling is only set around the outside two inches. The center should still be wobbly. Now, like the apple pie, we're going to let it cool completely before digging in. Yada yada yada, just enough time to make another pie. How about my favorite, blueberry? You can, of course, use fresh blueberries, but frozen turns out just as well in a pie, and all you got to do is let them defrost and drain for a while. While those are doing their thing in a small bowl, we're going to combine half a cup of sugar, a quarter cup of cornstarch, and the zest of one lemon. This, as you can imagine, is both going to sweeten and thicken our blueberry filling. So let's mix them all together. Probably the easiest pie filling in pie filling history. And for this one, why don't we go a little crazy and make ourselves a lattice pie, which sounds intimidating, but is a lot easier than you think. First, we just got to take the top half of our dough and roll it out into a large rectangle, which we are going to cut into 10 equally sized strips, or 16 if you're not very good at measuring things like me. And we're going to mate it to a pie crust that we have not blind baked, but we have refrigerated. Just make sure you're baking all these pies on a preheated pie stone to prevent a soggy bottom. Into our pie shell goes the blueberry mixture, and then we're going to begin a lettucing. We're going to start by laying five strips evenly and parallel to one another across the top of the pie, one in the center, two each to the right and left. Easy, right? Then all we got to do is lift up two of these strips and snake another strip in underneath them perpendicular. Then we're going to lay those two strips back down on top of the new strip, and now we're going to repeat the process this time with the three strips that we didn't pull back last round. You see where I'm going with this? We're basically just just alternating which strips we lift up while we lay down a perpendicular strip underneath. And then we're just going to trim the edges, tuck them underneath the bottom crust nice and tight, and there you have it, a latticed pie. Easier than you think. We are likewise going to brush this down with egg white and sprinkle it with granulated sugar for that sheen. And this one we're going to bake at 400 degrees Fahrenheit for 30 to 45 minutes until deeply golden brown and bubbling with berry goodness. And I'm sorry to say, just like the other pies, it's got to cool completely at least four hours before we can tuck in. But once it is cooled off, we got some cold hard evidence that we have no soggy bottoms in the house. These are coming right out of their pie plates, holding their shape and not leaking all over the place. And as you can see, I slightly overbaked my 
pumpkin pie and it cracked, but that is easily remedied with a little bit of whipped cream. Well, there you have it, folks. It's pie season, and hopefully this video has given you some new tools to keep in your arsenal of pie tips and tricks. This episode of Basics with Babish is sponsored by Good and Gather, the new flagship grocery brand only at Target. As I'm sure you've noticed, almost all the ingredients I used to make these pies were Good and Gather products. I can now attest to Good and Gather's taste first approach. All products are formulated without artificial flavors, synthetic colors, artificial sweeteners, and high fructose corn syrup. They use high quality ingredients that certainly make for better tasting pies, and I can't wait to try other Good and Gather products in future recipes. If you're wondering where you can get your hands on Good and Gather items, fret not. The new line is launching this fall and will roll out new products throughout 2020. They even have ready-made items that provide shortcuts in the kitchen, so if you don't have tons of free time or make a cooking show for a living, but still want amazing tasting ingredients, Target's Good and Gather products definitely have something just for you. To see all of what Good and Gather has to offer, visit your local Target store or shop online here.